speaking of electoral democracy, let's now move to democracy in the labor movement. So our guest today is Paul Trujillo. He is a UPS worker and a steering committee member of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. So welcome, Paul. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Yeah, of course. Um, so maybe let's start out. I mean, first for our, our listening audience, I mean, can you explain, first of all, what is Teamsters for a Democratic Union? What are some of the main goals of this organization? And what would you say are some of the, before this most recent election, the main victories that you've won in the past? Okay. Um, so Teamsters for a Democratic Union, or, or TDU as we refer to it, um, is a grassroots organization that has focused heavily on training up leaders. Um, we allow basically any member to come in and learn what it is first to be a union member and to give them the skill set they need to be effective, whether that be as a union steward or as a union officer. Uh, they've also served as the watchdog for the Teamsters Union since 1976, uh, trying to ferret out corruption and and make sure that uh, the, the, the members will be done. As far as, as uh, big victories leading up to this, this point, um, we credit TDU with, with being able to actually vote as a Teamsters Union member. Not all members, not all unions uh, actually vote for their leadership. And TDU is key for, for winning the ability for Teamsters to, to actually cast it as a member a vote uh, for their leadership. Uh, additionally, um, when it comes to more recent victories, uh, we've worked very hard within the, the pension movement to, uh, to get uh, pension protections back in place with the Butch Lewis Act. And TDU has been instrumental in, in putting that into place. And then also we, uh, more recently within our convention, we were able to get the uh, two-thirds rule, which was in place. Now the two-thirds rule, uh, to give you a quick background on it, is Teamsters could vote against the contract, but unless two-thirds of the members uh, voted against it, even if the, the majority voting uh, did not vote in favor of it, the contract could still be enacted, which we saw with our previous UPS contract. So this previous uh, Teamster convention, we were able to remove the two-thirds rule. So that's kind of where we are currently with it. Yeah, and we actually had Ken Paff on the show, uh, feels maybe even a, a year ago, to talk about the uh, big pension victory. Um, and so in this most recent election that <clears throat> everyone's talking about, well, in the previous election, I believe it's 2017, if I'm correct, um, the slate backed by TDU lost very narrowly. And then this time, it really wasn't even close. And I'm sure you have the numbers on hand you can talk about if you want. But, I mean, what do you think were the main issues that motivated so many members to vote differently this time around? Well, so a big part of that, like you said, last go around, we brushed our fingertips against it. We came so close within a few thousand votes of taking the rank and file, taking control of the union, uh, which hadn't happened since the early 90s. Um, this go round we recognize that TDU can't do it alone. And this time we built a coalition and this coalition of, of leaders across the country put together that were focused one that believed that we could win and two were the right people to have in the jobs. So this coalition worked together to, to put the, the people in place. What we learned from, from running a grassroots organization from, from running a grassroots campaign previously that you needed boots in the ground, but you also needed to be better put together, better structured in order to, 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 to get the win. So we knew we could do it and we knew how to do it this time. So we, we learned from our mistakes and we were able to put it in place. Like you said, we, we came very, very close last time, but uh, this time it was in, in a quite an impressive uh, margin of victory. And, you know, what kind of organizing did you do in the years prior to the election that kind of laid the groundwork for this victory? And what were some of those issues that you kind of got members mobilized around first before translating that into like an electoral victory? So a lot of this, again, boils back to that UPS contract. The, the vast majority of Teamsters voted against it. It was still shoved in our face. Um, so we had what we call the vote no movement. And if you had Ken on previously, I have no doubt that he he spoke at, at great length about that. Um, but we were against this contract. We did not want to create a, a second tier of workers. And we've used that as somewhat of a rallying cry uh, when organizing members from the ground up. You know, there's no reason that two people doing the exact same job should make different money. Uh, it, it's a fundamental uh, part of being union for equality. And this was a, a great inequality uh, being foisted upon us. So 
in addition to using that as a rallying cry, it was continuous grassroots organizing, especially on behalf of TDU. Um, meetings at the convention, constant trainings, uh, learning how to deal within the subpar contract that we had, learning how to use that contract to your best advantage. And TDU has been instrumental with, uh, with, with holding trainings year round, especially during the pandemic with uh, virtual trainings available and has kept the members both energized and connected into the labor movement as a whole. And, you know, what do you think will be the priorities for this new leadership going forward in their first term? I assume it's like a four year term. Um, you know, what, what are going to be some of the main things they'll focus on as a priority to do differently? And what kind of challenges and obstacles do you think they'll face? And you kind of referenced briefly the last time there was a reform leadership was in the 1990s with with Ron Carey. And, you know, of course, he had, he wasn't like he was able to just easily implement everything he wanted to. They were difficult, different obstacles within the union. So what do you think the priorities will be and what kind of obstacles will this new leadership have to contend with? So, yeah, like you said, you know, this is a big ship. It's very, very slow to turn. Um, so the, the number one thing that we're going to have to do from day one is going to be regaining the, the faith and the trust of the members. You know, we, we look at this turnout in the election and while we won overwhelmingly, it's the lowest turnout that we've had in history. And part of that is members are you know they feel distant from the international they're not connected and they saw previously their votes didn't matter their vote wasn't respected their voices were, went unheard so part of that's going to be rebuilding with internal organizing to show that that you know this is a union you can have faith in this is a union that uh, that you can trust and is strong um priorities you know the biggest baddest uh dog in the fight right now is is amazon and that's going to be a priority as far as uh, figuring out how to take on Amazon and, and organizing that. But the more immediately, we do have two national contracts that we'll be addressing almost from day one, which is our, our uh, car haul contract and then our UPS uh, national contract. And so getting a strong UPS contract is going to go a long way of getting buyback from the members to get them more involved with the international. And just to follow up on Amazon, you know, again, there's a lot of buzz about, you know, this new leadership taking on Amazon. Of course, we know just because you have good leadership doesn't mean that organizing Amazon is going to be easy. I mean, do you have any thoughts on kind of like what, how this might play out? What should kind of be the approach towards Amazon in the coming years, knowing that, of course, we're not going to do this in just a year? So and this is this is the million dollar question. Right. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you saw today, uh, you know, best from Alabama is going to re has been ordered to rerun their uh, their Amazon election. Mm -hmm. So all eyes are, are once again going to be on Amazon. As far as method of taking it on, the first step that we're going to need to do is show that our contracts are the best. And that's going to start with our UPS contract to show that we do have strong language, that we can back it up, that our members are proud of the contracts that we negotiate with. Because it is a, a problem when negotiating to have a contract that all your members are upset about. It's an easy thing for companies to point at. It's an easy low-hanging fruit for the, the union busters that companies like Amazon employ. Um, the second facet of that is no matter how much money the Teamsters have, we're not going to have enough money to order to to hire, you know, call it the, the 10,000 organizers it would take to launch a, a, a massive traditional style organizing drive at, at Amazon, which means getting grassroots buy-in. And again, part of that is rebuilding the, the faith of our members. And part of that is training people, giving them the skill set. So in the near future or in the immediate future, that's going to be identifying leaders and giving them the skills they're going to need to take on Amazon. And then using traditional methods uh, within organizing, such as salting and things like that. Uh, but also we need to start thinking outside of the box. We keep taking these companies on one at a time, and that hasn't been working. Taking a company on like Amazon at a single barn, something like Bessemer, they're able to throw millions and millions of dollars of anti-union resources against us. That's not going to work. We're going to need to divide and conquer Amazon, make them fight on multiple fronts. So we're going to need to build coalitions and to train up better leadership for that. And just to I'll go off script for a little bit, it just kind of entered my mind as you were talking about, you know, thinking outside the box and building coalitions. I mean, do you see any role for the quote unquote organized left in the fight against Amazon? I mean, you know, do you have do you, DSA chapters, for example, scattered across the city, some with more capacity than others. Um, you know, do you think for someone out there who's maybe like, you know, I'm not an Amazon worker, or I'm not a union member, but I want to help in the fight against Amazon. 
do you, do you envision there could be any role for someone like that? Absolutely. And it, it's going to be important to include, again, non-traditional roles. We, we've tried going about this the, the old ways where you got an organizer standing up front, passing out cards, yelling at everyone, bringing them in. That doesn't work anymore. Okay. They have, they have our playbook. We don't deviate from it. And so using groups like the DSA to work alongside us is, would be a tremendous asset. Um, you know, we have seen a tremendous shift since we've had the, uh, I believe what Texas A&M is, is, is titling the great resignation. Since that has started taking place, um, you've seen workers in a much larger numbers flock to non-traditional organizing uh, methods. We've seen companies actually investment capital backed companies doing apps to, to organize where people, you know, can, can in, do, organize independently their own groups. You don't need a big union uh, to do that. So taking structures like that and partnering with groups like the DSA to help us with, you know, Hey, we need to, you know, put literature out here. We need contact people for these, you know, these geofence groups or, or however you want to group them apart or group them together. Um, having more allies and more boots in the ground is going to be tremendously large or tremendously helpful. And seeing the changes within legislation that we have, have currently has been tremendously helpful and, and heartening for the labor movement. You know, uh, Joe Biden for his faults has been, in my opinion, a, a, a friend to labor thus far and has done great things for us um, in righting the wrongs that we've seen under the previous four years. So um, even in, in lobbying for additional legislation changes, things like, you know, I'm, I'm in a right to work state. So things like fair share fees or, or you know, repealing right to work as, as a, um, as an a ultimate goal, things like that help us in our organizing, period. So whatever role somebody wants to play, there is a role in these coalitions. There is a way for you to help. And uh, we're more than happy to have them on board. All right. And then, you know, lastly, shifting back to UPS. So, I mean, as a UPS worker, I mean, what are some of the changes you've seen in the company, um, you know, over the years? And what do you kind of see as specifically going to be the main sticking points in that 2023 contract fight with UPS? Well, so the, the first one, again, low hanging fruit is our Article 22 fours, um, which are our are, are, package car drivers that, that make six dollars an hour less for doing the same job. So the people that you see coming to your house delivering packages, some of them make a higher rate than others just because they were classified differently. That's going to be our very first fight. Um, the other things are going to reflect more of the world around us since the pandemic and, and, and because of the pandemic. So we've seen with the great resignation, we've seen a demand for higher wages. Uh, UPS is used to being a premium employer paying higher rates. When I started um, in 2007, uh, it was considered premium because we got insurance very quickly. We were paid an okay wage. Um but it was rapidly raised. Now we're paying the same as a Walmart, the same as as uh, the, the corner store. And that doesn't get the employees that stick around. That doesn't get employees that, uh, that, that want to be there. So raising the part-time starting rate and creating a living wage for part-timers in a more defined path towards full-time for them rather than just package car, basically going back to the, the Ron Carey era of creating full-time inside jobs. Uh, is going to be a, a major focus within this contract. But the 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 biggest thing that I'm hearing from from drivers and from uh, from coworkers is they want defined contract. They want to clarify a lot of the language within the contract, and that starts with the defined work week. Since this this pandemic has started, many people have been working six days a week. Most of my coworkers are over two years now working six days a week, uh, forced overtime, and there is no relief in sight. So getting better defined work week, a five day work week would be a wonderful, wonderful thing um, in greater pyramiding of our of our overtime or greater structure of the overtime. Because at this point, the company is just willing to pay out whatever it takes to get the job done. And it makes for, for very difficult for a person to have a home life. So these are going to be the focuses, I think, that we see from members um, looking at the UPS contract. Um, realistically in the very near future. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.